and I'm glad to introduce our um, speaker for today, Mr. Chrysler C. Tanalgo. Chrysler is currently a PhD candidate in ecology at the Landscape Ecology Group Center for Integrative Conservation of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Xingxuang Bana uh, Tropical Botanical Garden at Yunnan Province, China. He's an early career scientist interested in uh, exploring how conservation can be made easy and accessible for scientists and uh, policymakers. His current uh, fo uh, research focuses on developing conservation priorities to protect bats and their habitats in the tropics and across the world by integrating species diversity, landscape features, and anthropogenic threats. And in his research, Chrysler includes methods creation, gaps assessment, and policy examination. Chrysler is also a faculty member of the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Southern Mindanao. And at present, he is in Germany for his fellowship at the Sukunskolleg and the Center for the Advanced Study of uh, Collective Behavior at the University of Constance to advance his work on animal behavior and hunting risks. Chrysler has published several papers on bats, birds, and the human dimension of conservation. Friends, let us all welcome Chrysler Tanalgo. Chrysler? Hi, sir. Uh, wait, I will share the screen. So uh, thank you, sir, for that uh, warm welcome and introduction. So hello, po, and good afternoon, and good morning, everyone from here at Constance. So before I start, I would like to thank the UPLB Museum of Natural History for inviting and organizing this biodiversity seminar and also to CAM NSS for connecting me to the UPLB MNHS, MNH for the uh, opportunity to share our work and our findings. So once again, I am Chris and I am presently a PhD candidate from the Chinese Academy of Sciences and I'm currently finishing my research fellowship at the University of Constance here in Germany. And today I'm very excited to share to you a few of my current work and synthesis for Philippine bats. I mean, in terms of research and conservation and some insights from our global work and development. So I hope that you will find that today's talk and discussion interesting and insightful and if you have questions and further ideas that you would like to discuss or share, please uh, feel free to ask later and or you can contact me on my personal email or social media accounts. So without further ado, I will start my presentation. So uh, this presentation is a part of my uh, master's PhD program from Sishongbana Tropical Botanical Garden, which um, includes understanding of diversity patterns, threatening process, and development of tools for conservation, which spans from the national to global scale. But today I will focus my talk and discussion towards the priorities in the Philippines and target habitat priorities. So the outline of my talk or discussion this morning will focus on Philippine bat biodiversity, the research updates, uh, what have been done, in the post 2000 period, challenges in conservation in the Philippines, some future gaps and priorities, like what are the potential work we can develop. Then for the global scale, I will talk about the target habitat conservation, focusing on caves and some priority tools that are applicable for the Philippine setting. So uh, I think everyone is familiar that we are currently facing different ecological changes and our home planet is being forced to change significantly as a result of extensive uh, human alterations such as land use changes and excessive use of natural resources. Scientists and policymakers are in consensus that we are entering the what we call the sixth mass extinction in the Anthropocene, which uh, we have like an accelerating rate of extinction higher than the projected. Therefore, it is core in applied conservation 
or conservation biology to identify species and ecosystems that are at risk that needs urgent attention. However, achieving effective balance and long-term conservation is often challenged by many factors. So such, uh, such challenges include limited resources and allocation for conducting research to generate baseline evidence. And also the capacity to implement conservation actions on ground, especially on national level. Thus, it is important that we develop priorities to identify systems and population that really requires immediate interventions. However, not all species and ecosystems are perceived equally. So one example of this are bats and many of their habitats aside from the surface ecosystems. So bats, uh, many bats species are threatened by various threats, not only in the Philippines, but across the world. And human impacts and changing environment are among the key drivers for uh, many species declines around the world. In Southeast Asia, for example, it is projected that at least 171 species are projected to be affected by climate change and land use changes in the near future in 2050 to 2080 projection. So bats are really important. So but despite its enormous ecosystem services, funding allocation for the research and protection of either their population or habitat remains significantly low compared to more appealing species. So to take, uh, take a look, for example, in our recent um, review, we found that large bat species such as flying foxes and medium fruit bats are more efficient seed dispersers in long distances compared to other taxonomic groups such as primates and elephants. Yet, as conservation decision is often based on charismatic taxa such as those megafauna like panda, elephants, tigers, that is sometimes not the best representative to entirely protect a community or large fraction of species. This practice is common in conservation and it leaves behind many important and critical ecosystems, including large fraction of bat species around the world. So it is essential that we highlight bat priorities, especially in national scale. For example, we don't have megafauna in the Philippines. I mean, we have, but very few. So why Philippine bats? So the Philippine bat biodiversity is relatively highest in the tropics. Despite, despite this, despite the high biodiversity of bats, there is no clear priorities in the Philippine bat research and conservation. Therefore, addressing these questions enable us to set achievable conservation based a national setting and our national capacity. So developing effective conservation management and priorities in a mega diverse island countries such as the Philippines, uh, based only on assessing the taxon taxonomic components or I mean like species diversity is not enough. It requires multiple approaches that identify species, population or regions that facing largest threats in the near future. So to effectively develop conservation interventions. So here in this synthesis, our approach encompasses multiple facets of biodiversity conservation assessment by combining species diversity, knowledge gaps, and threatening process to inform the identification of priority species and habitats that require immediate conservation attention at present and in the future. So we started by building a data set based from recent existing literature from 2000 to 2017. So this is to enable us create a synthesis and compared efforts across species, thematic areas, and habitat types. 
we then developed two indices. So there's a two synthesis for Philippine bats, the first synthesis, the second synthesis. So the two indices um, aims to measure and synthesize species priorities based on research and ecologist, ecological status and existing threats. So we have what we call as the SREA, based on number of studies per species, thematic area per unit time, then we calculated uh, uh, in 17 years time frame. Then using the same data set, we develop a second synthesis that aims to uh, develop national prioritization based on threats, endemism, and red list conservation categories. So first, our results show that there are an average of 88 studies per year for Philippine bats. So that is relatively small. I mean, very few um, if compared to other countries. So majority of the studies are uh, in the Luzon Island followed by Mindanao and are very few were conducted at the national level. For example, we're like we're comparing results from across all islands like or like a synchronized study. So in terms of um, effort across thematic areas, the majority of the studies are skewed towards research on diversity and community assessment, and such as those surveys or rapid assessment with very uh, little effort towards species taxonomy and systematics and different aspects of species ecology. And like, for example, the response of bat communities or bat species on habitat changes. So in terms of habitats, most studies are focused on forest ecosystems or surface ecosystems. And nearly 80% of the Philippine bats are assessed to be forest species with a quarter, like at least 25% are, are very dependent on intact forest, while more than a quarter are cave dwelling species. So what are some of the gaps? Ano yung mga kulang sa Philippine bat research? So many Philippine bat research are conducted recently, like from 2000 to 2017, uh, suggest potential new species from different surveys are suggesting that we found a new species or a potential new species. However, the discovery and resolution of like problematic or cryptic bat species, especially from uh, insect bats like, uh, like the rhinolophids or the hypobats remains lacking for many species. And the discovery of new species is very low compared to other Southeast Asian countries, such as Thailand, Myanmar, or versus other mammalian groups in the Philippines. So this is another important priorities for bat research uh, and scientists, especially the early careers, to focus at the present and future. So in terms of effort, if the effort of the bat and uh, the research at the species level are analyzed and compared, only 13% of 79 species have an adequate research effort, it means that they have a value of more than one research for the time frame. So research efforts are intensive for those that are either threatened or larger or widespread. That means because they are easy to to sample, they are more abundant and widespread or cosmopolitan across the Philippines. Um, primarily, we also found that larger species are more threatened and facing more threatening process compared to smaller species. But when we compare research effort allocation versus conservation priority needs, we found that there is a weak and non-significant relationship so walang masyadong relationship yung effort needs and yung research priority. So this is something that we need to address. We need to fill in the gaps that we need to have a congruence between research effort and those that really needs an effort. So then for key threatening process, chiefly most of the threats are anthropogenic or 
human-made and like land use changes. So it differs. So most of there's a large percentage of threatened species are facing multiple threats and threats varies across all bat families. So I will discuss common threats here, then I will just mention some issues about it. So lagging and deforestation is key. It's one of the first um, key threats, excuse me. So lagging and deforestation is prevalent in the Philippines and posing a threat to roughly like three quarters of bat species. And that is an under underestimation because there's a very few studies on, on how um, land use changes affect bat species and their communities. While majority of the studies are from ecosystems, like I said, very few are comparing bat diversity across forest types or other habitats. And our understanding on this aspect is um, very low, especially like how species ecology and response to land use change like deforestation, shifting agriculture and mining. In addition, in areas where rate of tree cover loss, if you could see in the figure in the map, um, there's a very, there's a higher or like fewer bat surveys have taken place. And this has important implication to our understanding of the impacts of deforestation to bat biodiversity. Also, high endemism patterns of bats uh, are in the forest and pristine ecosystem. So it warrants more intensive protection and remaining forest in the remaining uh, forested areas in the country. So next threat is um, hunting. So this is not only for Philippine bats. So we have at least a 42 species of Philippine bats that are hunted. So, and this is a higher proportion than previously thought. However, this is not yet known on a larger scale and we're trying to investigate this. So hunting is very underestimated threats for uh, many bat species, including the Philippines. For example, in Ripoll et al. in 2016, the analysis only focused on threatened species and it excludes those common and widespread. So if you could look at this, the percentage is very low, but our evidence from the Philippines and other Southeast Asian country, um, it alone showed that majority of the hunted species are actually those common and hyperabundant or those widespread species, which are usually not included uh, in protection policies. So, uh, it's really important that we're, we develop a wide scale assessment that will enable a clear understanding of the extent of species threatened by direct threats such as hunting and their projected extinction risks. So this is an ongoing project. This is one of my projects here in Constance. And later on, uh, I will invite you if you're interested to collaborate on, on this work. So why people hunt, why people in the Philippines are hunting. One of the main reasons that we know so far is for subsistence. Subsistence or like for consumption is the primary reason for hunting bats. But this is, is um, this can also be attributed to the lack of state policies like I mentioned earlier that reinforce the protection of species from being hunted or harvested in massive amount, especially those that are not classified as threatened. We all know that most of the conservation um, protection policies in a national scale usually focus or are like skewed more towards those that are threatened, threatened species. Such case then may lead to what we call the passenger pigeon fiasco effect. So if you're familiar with the story of the passenger pigeon, they're common before, they're very widespread, it's cosmopolitan, but with the continuous human activities such as hunting and food consumption, 
especially given that many species lack overarching legislative measures for protection. Many, I mean, the population of passenger pigeon really decreased or like they become, they become extinct. So, however, this is not yet known on a larger scale. And again, we are trying to investigate this. Uh, we have like trying, there are several studies in the Philippines uh, working on this and we're trying to, to compare our data globally and in the national scale. So this is an interesting research that we really look forward in the future. Next threat is um, an ecotourism. While cave tourism and bat watching may provide relevance to bat management as like a strategy to circumvent misconception and educate the public about bat importance and increase their awareness and involvement to species protection. However, drawbacks of ecotourism towards environment uh, is undeniable. And we therefore emphasize caution in employing tourism as a tool for conservation as bat cave tourism may pose more threat and harm if it's unregulated and this may affect both the species and the entire ecosystem and this is a true case in the philippines so we have a lot of caves that are that are containing large populations but they are also open for ecotourism without or very little protection or regulation. So ecotourism is both good and bad for bats. Um, some examples of negative impacts of cave tourism are direct disturbance to roosting bats that may alter their behavior or their like roosting patterns. So in some countries such as in Southeast Asia, so I'm giving example in the Southeast in the context of Southeast Asia, uh, religious activities in caves are often at the same time as many species are on their critical reproductive stage. And this is very crucial because some of them may change their behavior or they will like, they will affect their uh, population in the future. Cave tourism may also introduce destructive diseases. Uh, this is not yet a case in the tropics, but in the temperate region, they're uh, currently facing the white nose syndrome that affects a many bat population and species in the Palearctic region to from the US to the European region. Next threat, uh, this is not really, I'm not sure if this is a threat or this could be considered as an emerging concern. We wrote this in our uh, second synthesis that we emphasized about the scientific over collection for disease research and public perception. So is collecting bat vouchers or bat specimen good for conservation? Um, it is sometimes claimed according to like one paper, this sometimes claimed that bat specimen collection is necessary for conservation, yet um, direct evidence that this is important. I mean, the evidence saying that it's really important still lacking. So we need to put caution on collecting bats for either disease or for like museum. So globally, this is an emerging um, issue. If you look at the map from a global collection study uh, in Russo et al in 2017, and in the Philippines, this is an overlooked concerns for both research and conservation. For example, from all these studies that we analyzed, we found that nearly half of all bat species are collected for disease research. We weigh um, with at least seven endemics in the country are collected for disease. While this is important facet of bat research, um, bat uh, disease studies are important. However, um, we believe that over collect many bat species are over collected and killed. So such as one study alone killed 1000 plus of bat individuals from 14 species. So this is for conservation perspective, this is not good for conservation. Imagine you kill 
1,000, um, 1,047 individuals. This is just from one study. So there are ways to mitigate this. So this is a good reference. This is a perspective uh, written by colleagues. So if you're collecting bats, it's really important that you, you think first to prioritize what information you need. Do you really need to kill bats? Or are there any alternative methods or the non-lethal methods to, to ensure that we are not compromising bat species, especially those that are um, narrow range species. So I believe collection is part of research, but it is really important that we ensure we collect properly or we collect accordingly based on the needs or our practice. So this is um, interesting. Again, this is an interesting literature that will guide you to uh, think first before killing or collecting bad specimen. Next, so this is a little bit controversial and I think the bat community are divided about this. So another concern now that we are facing in bat conservation is the disassociation of bats in disease spread. We all know that in the early days of the COVID-19 outbreak, the public and news lines immediately sensationalized and demonized bats as a main culprit of the pandemic. But if you're familiar with bat biology and their disease ecology, you know that bats aren't the blame for this. While this is research and surveillance is again important aspect of like bat biology, it is important for bat conservation biologists and um, virologists or like disease scientists to take extra careful in public messaging to counter misinformation and especially to bolster or restore positive connections between human and bats in the post COVID-19 period. So it is really important that we create prudent and unprejudiced framing of information. So in, in communicating about bats and COVID-19, it is really important that we are careful of what information we are telling the public because the public would easily believe on it. So these are good, again, these are good references uh, written by colleagues. So first it's like how negative framings in virological research in feral bat conservation. So this is a very good perspective. This is a very enlightening for all of us doing research. So like how we should create information or how we like publicize information to ensure like we are doing a good research and good communication for conservation. And the next paper, this is uh, a guidelines for communicating about bats to prevent persecution in the time of COVID-19. There are some cases, I'm not sure in the Philippines if there are like reported um, persecution, but in social media, I can, I can see, I can see people telling that, oh, we should call, we should kill the bat colonies because Yes, they are like, they're blaming bats for the COVID uh, pandemic. Then again, it's both a disease research and conservation important. Balance is very important. So we ensure that we are doing the right thing for, for bats. So next threat, or should I say an unknown threat in the Philippines for Philippine bats. So changing climate, um, is expected to impact large number of bat species in the future. However, the latest analysis is only focused on the mainland Southeast Asia. So it is projected that in the 19, in 2050 to in 2080, three to 9% of the species would lose their niche and like, two to 6% species may have no suitable niche space. So in the Philippines, however, the knowledge on the projected, um, projected impact of global changing climate is lacking. So we don't know yet how climate change will affect, but 
it is sure that many of our bat species will be affected, especially those that are island or endemic species with very limited geographical range are expected to be the most affected groups. So thus, um, future studies on Philippine bats are encouraged to focus on modeling or understanding the impacts of changing climate to their future distribution and persistence. So for students, uh, if you're interested, this is a very cool project that you develop. So many of our bats are really facing a lot of threats. So their habitats, their population, but uh, there's always hope. Um, I'm always optimistic. Um, I'm on the, on the half full side of conservation. So there are different organizations, different policies that are existing to protect um, our Philippine bats. So these are some few of the efforts. I know there's a lot, I cannot put them all in one slide, but there are really a lot of people working, dedicating their lives on either research or conservation of Philippine bats. So um, there's hope, there's always hope for Philippine bats. Although this is not um, bats in the Philippines are, the studies are not very diverse. Um, there's a very good effort towards their conservation. So what are the key messages for the Philippine bat research and conservation? My first important message is we need to diversify our priorities to address knowledge gaps and circumvent known threats. So we need to diversify our studies and not only on rapid assessment, not only on, on surveys, we need to look at, to fill in the gaps, those areas in ecological, especially taxonomic and develop conservation evidence studies are very important. So we improve our conservation and understanding of Philippine bats. Next, support research on least threatened or least known species and habitats. So most of the funding are for Philippine bats are usually skewed towards those that are endangered or larger species. And we need to support more studies on common and abundant and to see like how their populations are changing, how their habitats are affected by different threats. So these are some of the example research. Um, these are just some example, and I know there's a lot to study for Philippine bats. So first, for taxonomy and develop like species taxonomy using combined approach like integrative taxonomy in terms of genetics, morphology, and ecolocation. And I, uh, I saw uh, recent papers on, on this, especially on ecolocation. This is really good progress for Philippine bats. We also need to study bat plant interactions like pollination, seed dispersals, uh, like impacts of land use changes and the valuation of ecosystem services uh, in bat dependent crops such as durian. So this is widely studied in Thailand and Malaysia and I'm sure in Philippines, especially in Southern Philippines, this is a really good case to work on at present. So next is the important function of bats in agroecosystems, like their diets and like how they, they forage and insects in agroecosystem or natural ecosystem. Uh, we also need to focus on like bat behavior and cognition and how they react or the response in a changing climate and monitoring of important and intact populations and also studies on critical populations. Like we need to understand their threatening process and its extent. So we also need to, for among, I mean, for fellow bat biologists, early careers or scientists, we also need to intensify equitable collaboration in Philippine bats, uh, for Philippine bat and biodiversity research and conservation. This is something that we really need to work on because I noticed, I mean, this is just like, this is just my observation. Like we have a lot of papers from the present time, but I can only see, and I'm also guilty of that, that we have 
lack of like different institutions working together. So this is something that we need to work on to achieve um, greater goals for Philippine bats. The next, we need to develop genuine capacity building, especially among early careers and budding bat biologists. We need to train more. We need to train more bat people and especially the younger ones. So for the younger ones, we also encourage you to, to, to get in touch, to look for your mentors, to, to connect to your, to your ati, um, ates and kuya, sorry, or like to your, to the scientists that, you know, so it's really good that we develop this capacity building. And next, um, this is, um, I added this key message when I have a discussion with one colleague in Philippine Bat Conservation is the creation of Philippine Bat Conservation Network. So this is uh, what we really wanted to we envision a long time ago. And we, I really hope I encourage my fellow bat uh, scientists to, to think about the creation of a Philippine Bat Conservation Network or a similar a thing that will focus on conservation research and the advancement of Philippine bats. So this is the end of my presentation on Philippines. Now we are moving on a global perspective. So this is part, this work is part of the Trinity Project framework to develop global bat cave priorities. So among earth ecosystems, so this chapter will focus only on cave dwelling bats or on caves and subterranean ecosystems. So among earth's ecosystems, caves and underground ecosystem covers at least um, around 20% of land surface, but are often an underrated ecosystem despite it contains uh, many unique and endemic species. For example, in Chinese caves and many tropical Southeast Asian caves, an estimated of 90% of described species are very new to science or they're very, are they're only, they can only be found in one cave habitat. However, many cave ecosystems lack systematic studies and conservation in many regions compared to the surface ecosystems such as forests and other uh, habitat types. So in Southeast Asia, uh, this region alone has over 800,000 square kilometer of karst areas and many species remains undiscovered, but only 13% of the total karst cave ecosystems are protected by international or statutory policies. So there's an indeed clear gaps in conservation of these fragile ecosystems. And there's a need to develop effective measures to conserve and protect the remaining intact or those highly threatened habitats. But again, like I said earlier, developing such measures is challenging. And uh, therefore, there's a need to establish a holistic and cost-effective strategies. You know, in conservation, we don't have all those money that we need to do conservation as much as we want. So we will find shortcuts. Conservation biologists love shortcuts. It's not because we're lazy, but because we don't have a lot of money. So surrogate taxas or taxa are often used as shortcuts or cost-effective approach to um, identify geographical or species priorities for conservation. So within cave ecosystems, bats are ideal taxa as they provide ecosystem services such as pollination, seed dispersal, insect pest reduction when they forage outside. Then, when they return inside the caves, bats are considered as keystone species as they provide energy from the outside of the cave in the form of their excreta like a guano or their urine that is important for many cave dependent species such as 
macro invertebrates or those uh, other cave vertebrates. Therefore, bats are important cave conservation surrogates or shortcuts. In other words, when cave bats, when we conserve cave bats, they indicate the diversity of other species or the entire communities within the caves. So meaning conserving bats means we are conserving other species and maintaining their ecosystem balance in caves. So there are different um, methods or approaches that were developed to prioritize caves based on the concept of uh, um, surrogate taxa. Um, however, um, there were measures before that were developed and adapted that are based on cave invertebrates and local physical factors. However, these indices and strategies are um, quite expensive and requires rigorous training. So in addition, it does not include other measures such as rarity, um, endemism, and other uh, conservation status because taxonomy is challenged. So when you don't know their taxonomy, you cannot um, assign their conservation status. And species richness alone is not enough measure to, to identify important um, important caves. To address this gap, we created a new cave biodiversity tool. So conservation decision-making depends on clear delineation between uh, what is important to, and to develop priorities. As frequently, priorities uh, fail to represent what is genuinely important or do not represent communities effectively. So um, yes, we use bats, then it's difficult to identify um, caves. We don't know which one is important, which is priority. Sometimes choosing what is important and what is priority is difficult. So mahirap piliin kung sino ang pipiliin mo, ang, the important or the, because sometimes important caves are not always prioritized. So. We created the, what we call the Bat Cave Vulnerability Index. So this is a new tool that will balance conservation decision making. So we developed the BCVI. Um, this is a holistic tool that encompass both species diversity, landscape features, and threats. So this is a useful tool for rapid assessment of bat caves for priorities. So this is an adaptive management tool. This is easy to use and um, not really expensive. So it's easy to use. It's not a very complicated mathematical equation. So I will not really discuss the, the equation here, so, but if you're interested, I'm very happy to discuss this on a separate discussion or an email because it will take time for us to really discuss the equation itself, but it's easy. Um, it's holistic and uh, user-friendly, it's open access. And currently we are creating a manual. We have first the English version and we will open this for other colleagues so then they can translate and use this on a ground application. So the BCVI or is a standard index like I said earlier for evaluating bad case. So it contains, it, it includes the biotic potential and the biotic vulnerability of caves. So it includes the BP, the biotic potential, and the BV, which means the biotic vulnerability. The BP is represented by various species diversity and rarity measures. And the BV or the biotic vulnerability is represented by cave geophysical characteristics and human induced disturbance or landscape features. Then integrating species diversity and landscape features uh, provide us a well-rounded cave prioritization that is relevant for decision-making. So your decision here 
is based on how important SCAVE based on its diversity and how they should be prioritized based on their vulnerability. So it's, ba it's balance. You're balancing two elements in a simple yet effective way. So BCVI was developed to address, um, first it was developed to address issues in the Philippines, then we moved to the tropical region. So it was developed to address important cave, important gaps in, in cave and bat conservation in holistic and encompassing ways, such as determining and how to protect intact cave ecosystem that contains high biodiversity of bat communities. Also the BCVI or this tool will allow us or give us information to preserve mega population of cave bats and the standardization of our approach for comparative conservation actions in different scales. So why it's standardization is really important. So this will allow us to compare our data it's easy to compare when one scientist or one conservation biologist use the same tool. So like we agree that this is the measurement. So this is currently considered uh, in different regions by different colleagues. So uh, it's a lot of work to do, but this is really an exciting work that we are currently developing. So in the Philippines, we have some Examples of this from Sir Philip Alviola, and they really have a very interesting results. And they, 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 they change how it will be used by comparing the dry season and the wet season data. And there's really interesting results, and I'm very excited. Rizler, you're sorry. on mute. Okay, sir. Sorry. So um, I'm also working with some colleagues and fellow PhD on the application of the BCVI, and hopefully we can have a very good results um, across the globe. So there are good examples of this. Uh, we have one from the neotropical region, from the Brunca region of Costa Rica, led by a good friend and colleague, and also we have one from the Philippines uh, led by our colleague from the museum and my colleague from Sishongbana and Sir Philip as well. So this is, these are some example of the application of the tool. So it's, it looks complicated, but, um, but it's very easy to use. It's like plus minus and multiplication and using scoring and like criteria based. So like, again, if you're uh, interested, I'm very happy to, to allocate my time to discuss this further and how if you have some data that you want to analyze, uh, my team and me are happy to, to, to help you or guide you. So moving the application of BCVI, presently the scientists warning on conservation of subterranean ecosystems recommended the use of BCVI in prioritizing high biotic caves with sensitive population. So it prompts us to develop our next project to map important bat caves in a global scale. So my PhD work does not, uh, we're not really planning to do a global scale because I only intend to develop the, the tool, but we have this very interesting challenge and uh, we accepted it's they accepted this and we are challenged to explore this idea. Therefore, we are expanding and applying our framework in a larger scale. So to do that, we really need to have an extensive data. You cannot, I cannot survey all around the globe. So we need to assemble a data. We need to assemble colleagues. So we developed the dark side S project. It's the first version of the database. So we created a baseline for cave dwelling bats across the world based on literature extraction, data exchange, and like personal communications. 
This is a collaborative and an open access database aiming at collating and synthesizing publicly available data sets of cave dwelling bats. So the database has a wide application in bat research, particularly towards advancing comparative prioritization and monitoring, or like you, have, you want to model bat species distribution or anything that, uh, that are based on geographical information and information. So the data contain, the database contains species taxonomy, ecological traits, conservation status, um, species turnover, landscape features, and their biome distribution. So this is currently in preparation and hopefully we can make this paper available on preprint and we can share with you. Uh, but more information is needed as well as further support for long-term and sustainable platform implementation. So this is what we have right now. So the database uh, involves at least 30 collaborators and contains 6,600 occurrences data, but this is an, an updated number. Uh, last night I updated and I think we reached 7,000 plus representing 402 species. That is the 59% of all cave dwelling species or all known bats that are dependent on caves. This is from at least 1,930 caves. Those caves that are quali qualified based on our uh, criteria. So the data, um, we have a geographic bias. So most of our data are coming from Pali Arctic and Indomalaya. And we have a very small fraction from the Afrotropical. So this region, we really need to make effort. We encourage people from this region to, to share or make their data available in, in, um, in, in publication or data sharing. So this is again, one of the uh, goal of goals of the dark side S project. So the first version of the database. So how many cave dwelling bats we have in the planet or in the, in the earth? So before we thought that um, we don't really have an assessment. So our study using the combined database and our own assessment, we found that um, our analysis showed that almost half of, of all bat species regularly use caves in any part of their life histories. So we have like 678 species of bats um, are dependent or using caves for for their life history, for their reproduction, for their roosting, for, for any a function of their, of their existence, with 32% restricted to a single country or endemic in a single country. And 15% of the cave bats are in threatened categories with 12% data deficient, which is significantly a high rate of um, data deficiency and uh, threatened level. So amongst um, bio biogeographical realms, though the neotropic is the most sampled region in terms of species richness, endemism and species replaceability is highest in the old world tropics. So it spans from the Austral Oceania, to the Indomalaya, including the Philippines and the Pali Arctic uh, region. Highest endemism proportion is observed in the Austral Oceania, including the Pacific, uh, including some part of the Indomalaya region and the south part of China. So while in country level, China and Indonesia is, are the most species in terms of estimated species richness. Uh, despite that uh, high species diversity of cave dwelling bats, many species are facing multiple threats, um, either from direct, indirect, and natural threats. And before uh, we can effectively, effectively 
develop prioritization, it is essential that we understand first the extent of threats and risk or the sensitivity of the species. So um, the estimated proportion of cave bat species threatened with extinction, we estimated uh, between 13 to a 25% with 15% in average, which is lower compared to all global species. Um, that is around 16 to 35%. But we found that narrow species, um, narrow range species um, is an important, are more threatened or they are facing more extinction risk compared to those that are widespread. Like for example, island endemic species have higher extinction risks compared to those species in uh, mainland. And the same as the same pattern were observed with those geopolitically endemic or those species that can be found in a single country versus those that are widespread. So apart from geographical range, direct threats are significantly contributing to higher risk of extinction for many species. So we have the range and the direct threats as important factors why global cave dwelling bats are facing extinction risk, or I mean, they're more uh, at risk because of these factors. So this is what our model showed for all species and between the two suborders of bats. So in terms of threats, uh, we tried to understand key threats and their distribution in terms of biogeographic distribution. So nearly three quarters of cave dwelling bat species are exposed to various threats according to our combined analysis. So the proportion of direct and indirect threats differed regionally. So they differ. For example, hunting is more common in Afrotropic and the Indo-Malaya compared to the Neotropic and other regions. While natural threats such as changing climate, like increased storm frequencies or like um, drought remains, um, we remain lack of understanding of this threat, like the same case in the Philippine bat. So we don't really understand how climate change will affect cave dwelling bats, but this is really an important facet of conservation that we really need to understand in the future. So next, um, the first key threat. So I will only discuss a uh, key surface threats. So mining for mineral, and cement are often the key direct threats for many species and fragile karst habitats. So global infrastructure is increasing in many regions and therefore the demand for cement is increasing. So almost half of total global cement production is from the karst areas of tropical Asia. Uh, I mentioned earlier that on this region, bats are also diverse. The, the karst cover is also high. So interestingly, cement export and production is significantly higher and congruent in countries with high cave bat diversity or like high bat species richness and or the proportion of threatened species, for example, in Southern China, in Thailand and Indonesia in part because of the extensive limestone karsts in this region. So um, in this analysis, we found, for example, on this, we found that cement production is high in countries where there is a high species richness or high endemism. So nangyayari yung high extraction on this region. So it's also expected that we will have more I mean, cement production will increase. Like the roads, we have the road constructions, buildings and infrastructure in the global development. So the next threat um, 
that I will discuss um, is deforestation. So lastly, surface land use change may indirectly threat species, but it may be an important factor that increases the risks of species from future loss. For example, cave sites in more open area are more susceptible to human intrusion, highly visible to hunting, and accessible for ecotourism use. So in our global prioritization, we use surface threats as proxy to indicate cave vulnerability. So we, we map at least 12 landscape features and human variables. So using high resolution surface data, we have 12 landscape features and globally seven out of 12 landscape variables showed significant relationship to species uh, biotic values, but none of the landscape features and threat variables showed a strong correlation to cave biotic values. This may be because we are analyzing on uh, a broader scale, but on a smaller scale, there are diff I mean, on a finer scale, there are a lot of evidence showing that these variables are, uh, I should say, that they're affecting the species diversity or species turnover in caves. So tree diversity and uh, tree density, bare ground change, and short vegetation change showed a positive correlation with species biotic scores. And conversely, distance to river, tall tree loss, nightlight, and human population density showed a significant negative correlation, though this may in part uh, reflect the challenges in um, of sampling caves in tall forested areas, but also highlights that recently disturbed areas may be um, threatened. Furthermore, Using socio-ecological variables such as GDP per capita and percent forest cover, and also the cement production as a proxy to assess vulnerability, uh, it showed a consistent positive correlation among species diversity attributes such as endemism and proportion of threatened species. So it's really interesting to see these patterns. So among the 12 variables, we only use six variables to assess susceptibility of caves because we cannot use all the 12 because some of them are related or correlated to each other. So only we use six variables, including canopy cover, tree density, distance to river, distance to city, mine density, and distance to roads. So we modified the BCVI index to construct a broad and fine scale priorities using diversity data and landscape features. So earlier on the first version of BCVI, we only use species diversity, endemism and conservation status. So here to be adaptable in a global scale, we integrate species evolutionary distinctiveness or the ED and the corrected weighted endemism to measure BCVI, to compute BCVI on a larger scale, I mean, on a global scale, so that we can compare them easily. So we have a comparable assessment. Then the, we analyze our priorities, our index and values um, in broad and fine scale. The broad scale represents the biome level. So we compared across biome a level then the fine scale represent a site level priorities and we need to do this so we need to understand what are the priorities in a broader in a finer scale or we know where to focus or which habitats we need to focus so we modify the bcvi uh, earlier we only have three priorities but on the bcvi 2.0 we have three priorities. So we have the red, green, yellow, and blue. If a cave is red, it means that they have um, the cave of a high diversity and high threat exposure. So the potential action for this cave is to have an immediate action. It needs high priority. But conversely, a blue priority cave are 
caves that are facing high threat, but very low diversity, uh, or they may have already lost the entire species or their population. So these are the caves that are not worth attention. So caves that have low priority, have low, I mean, are not worth of attention. But it means that these caves can be open for like tourism or other use. But it also requires a careful assessment. Okay, so it's, there's a warning for using this that you have to be very careful in using this. So in between, we have the green priority caves that they are pristine, they're high biodiversity, but they're pristine and they all need monitoring so to ensure that they are um, still protected or they're still intact. Then ye yellow priority caves, so cave that needs intervention or may no longer worthwhile. So the yellow cave is like of a same similar low spectrum with the blow, blue, sorry, blue priority caves. So at first uh, we use the evolutionary distinctiveness and weighted endemism to compare by geographically. So at first we found that the rate of evolution, evolutionary distinctiveness based on our cave data, they differed significantly. Cave sites from the neotropical regions um, as the highest mean rate of ED and in contrast to the lowest in the Palearctic region. Then in terms of cave weighted endemism, it is highest in the Austral Oceania uh, that is consistent with the proportion of species endemism in this region. So this is dependent on the data that we have from the dark side database and our analysis. So this may change if we have more data in the future. So we emphasize caution on interpreting this data. So we combined all elements and we have this uh, map. So I will just show you the key patterns that we found. So when we apply the tool in global caves, Primarily, our analysis showed that most caves with lower threat levels show higher cave biotic potential, example, high evolutionary distinctiveness and endemism. Though this may be due to the loss of species from more disturbed caves. And this pattern is only significant in the fine scale in the sky and the fine scale level. So this is a simple illustration showing the relationship between cave biotic diversity and the threats present at caves. So synthesizing priorities. So after applying BCVI, we need to, to translate that to priorities. So it, between broad scale and fine scale. For easy understanding, we found that there's an uneven distribution of priorities in biome level. So 90% of the caves show high biotic vulnerability, but 88% of the caves are in lower biotic vulnerability or biotic potential, I should say. So it's not a good balance between biotic vulnerability and biotic potential because we only have 1% of the caves with high biotic values. While using fine scale, which is a site level, we found a more even distribution of priorities. So 19% of the caves are high in biotic vulnerability and 45 and 41% are in the high and mid high biotic vulnerability. So it's more even and it's giving us more useful information on the priorities of caves. So we are suggesting that if we want to do a national level prioritization, we use the fine scale data or the fine scale index that we produce compared to the broad scale. While broad scale is important, it only gives us a preview of the 
of the overall priorities, but it's not really useful in a site level implementation or like site level uh, assessment or monitoring. So we estimated, um, after that we translate the priorities. So we estimated 15% of the global average of red priority are in red priority caves with three to 28% representing high priorities in broad scale and fine scale respectively. So if, if you notice in broad scale, only 3% of the caves are red caves, but in fine scale, we found a more even and more realistic data because 28% are, I mean, there's a higher um, proportion of of red caves or high priority caves. So amongst region, the highest concentration of conservation priority need are in Paleoarctic and tropical region, except the Afrotropical, which requires more intensive data in the future. If you can see in the map, I'm not sure if it is clear, uh, the African region, we have a very small or like patchy uh, data. The patterns of concentration of high priority caves based on REMS or biogeographical REMS is also highest and the Paleoarctic closely followed by the Neotropical in the Indo-Malayan region. So tropical caves are very important. I mean, the high priority, priority caves are located in the tropical regions because they are more like biodiverse and they have more suitable habitats. While um, we also acknowledge our the caveats of our the caveats and gaps of our work, while there's no single silver bullet to resolve all these challenges, our present work offers a first baseline evidence of priorities to hard to map biodiversity hotspots such as the caves and subterranean ecosystems. So we have challenges that sought to be addressed in the future, which were not explored in the current work. For example, we are we only accounted the 90, no, 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 59% of global cave dwelling species. And the species coverage varied by region. For example, Indonesia uh, has some of the highest estimated bat cave species. Yet its contribution to the data set based on surveys and assessments uh, is among the lowest. So we have a uh, opposing species turnover or data turnover. Furthermore, um, accurate systematic and taxonomic studies for bats are very vital to appropriate conservation as caves. I mean, all know that caves host high endemism and many cave bats have high numbers of as yet undescribed uh, cryptic species. So for my synthesis for this, uh, a result from this work further highlight the importance of uh, prioritizing bat caves at local scales, but show that broader, uh, broader scale analysis is possible if we have a robust cave data and we use an effective parameters included in the analysis, for example, appropriate landscape features and threats. And lastly, developing priorities for these systems really require more systematic approaches as a standard measure to develop the uh, conservation needs to maintain a cave diversity. So conservation efforts around the globe are are present, but we need an effective and standardized priorities. So we have a consistent uh, measures. We also need, we also encourage to promote global equitable collaboration and open sharing of information because data, we really need robust data to develop this analysis. And uh, the last, the most important thing is the need to increase the highlighting of bats and their ecosystems in conservation decision-making, especially uh, now in the time of the uh, 
global pandemic that associate bats to its, uh, to its spread. So again, this part of the work is currently under review, but available on preprint. I need to show the link, but I can share on the chat box later if you're interested to read the manuscript. And we are, we have a lot of things that we're doing right now. We're juggling different projects and we are very happy to invite everyone to collaborate to any of these uh, ongoing projects. So we have the Global Bag Cave Vulnerability and Conservation Mapping Initiative, which is the baseline of the two other projects, the Dark Side S project. Uh, we are still preparing the manuscript. So if you're interested, if you have cave data out there, especially from the Philippines, please uh, contribute and we're happy to invite you as the co-author of the data paper. So we are still, we are supposed to distribute the draft last week, but after my last presentation in one other conference, uh, we have additional information and we have to redo the analysis. So if you're interested, please uh, message me or email me and I'm very happy to, to discuss to you further. Also, we have the mapping of the global bat hunting risk. I did not discuss this on this presentation, but this one um, is focused on understanding hunting, uh, projecting hunting risk and their extinction and the interplay of other threatening process. We also include the integration of animal behavior, uh, economic information like the GDP, and other measures to create a more holistic way of understanding hunting vulnerability and risk among species. So this ends my presentation and I would like to thank many people for these six years, I think this is six years, a six years project. Uh, I would like to thank, this is my landscape ecology group at Sishongbana Tropical Botanical Garden. And this is a, an updated, um, photo, but uh, we have a lot of members working on different taxa. I would like to thank the uh, Shishungbana Tropical Botanical Garden, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Department of Biological Sciences. I'm sure I have some colleagues here, so hi to everyone. And the University of Southern Mindanao and the University of Constance and the Sukuns Oleg for my current work, for my fellowship to advance one of my uh, chapters. So if you have further questions, things that you want to discuss, you can reach me on this uh, email. So on my personal email or in my uh, Twitter account. So once again, this ends my presentation and I really hope that you gained uh, something insightful and some information from this work. So now I'm happy to to answer questions or like discussions. All right. Thank you Thank very you. much, Chrysler, for that uh, you, very sir. solid presentation. And uh, congratulations for your uh, group's development of the BCVI uh, versions 1 and 2. And of course, yung uh, Dark Sides uh, database, uh, uh, which I think uh, will be of uh, very great use to our uh, bat ecologists and our bat researchers there. So uh, before we go to the Q and A, let's uh, uh, let's give a big warm uh, applause uh, for uh, Chrysler. And then uh, habang nagpapahinga siya, let's uh, proceed with the <laughs> short quiz <laughs> para naman makapagres siya ng content. All, all our key threatening uh, process to the Philippine bus except. A, B, C, and D. We have 15 seconds to answer. And 31, 31, 31% answered uh, the following. And let us see the, you know, the correct answer. It's climate change. Back it, Sir Chrysler. Um, because uh, it's not okay. Naririnig pa? Yes, yes. Because yes. it's not uh, well explored. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not. It's still an unknown threat for Philippine bats. We're still uh, 
looking forward for research uh, on this area of uh, Philippine bats, like how bat species uh, will react or will change its distribution in the future as as response to changing climate. All so right. we don't know it yet. Okay. So yun yung in recent. Okay. All right. Second question: How many Philippine bat species are dependent to forest ecosystems? The choices are 90, 50, 80, and 20. And the answers are coming in. And almost half of you answered 80%. Let's see the correct answer. Yes, 46% of you got it right. Third question, passenger Pigeon fiasco effects describe a blank species threatened. Uh, wait, let me check. Threatened by extensive hunting and human consumption. So the choices are endangered, vulnerable, common and widespread, and D endemic. And fifty-two percent of you answered the option C, and that one is the correct answer for passenger pigeon fiasco effect. Fourth question, what is the primary ec ecosystem services provided by old world fruit bats? We have four options here. And A, uh, almost all of you answered A, pollination and seed dispersal and that is the correct option. And last question. Cave dwelling bats are ideal cave conservation surrogates because they are blank. We have four options there. Time is up. And the answer is... Uh, 77% of you answered C, and that is the correct answer. Raming salamat. And uh, let us congratulate Jerry for uh, getting, uh, what do you call this, five, over, five out of five um, from the quiz here. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat po sa inyong mga, sa ating mga participants for uh, spending time for our quiz, let me just stop our sharing. All right, so let's proceed to the Q&A. Uh, again, just go to your chat box, put in your question there, and I will read it for everyone. All right, so uh, let's just wait for a few seconds for everyone to put in their questions. I hope nagamit yung time during the quiz para makapaglagay ng questions dito sa chat box. So let's just wait for a few. Siguro ako, I'll have a question. I think I wrote down one. Sir, uh, Sir Chrysler, do you think that he, the study of bats in urban uh, landscapes or yung mga urban roots, is it yes, significant sir. enough to the overall diversity and uh, distribution of, of bats? Um, Based yes, on sir. your studies. Uh, um uh in the philippines uh we don't really have a clear understanding of how bats or the diversity of bats sa uh, urban ecosystems so but there it's it's an interesting study because mm -hmm. in some especially like in green spaces or water bodies so urban ecosystems it's really important they could be a very good um urban ecosystem indicators so it's one of the um, important, I think, and very important research na na, na ma advance sa Philippine bats because we still we have a lot of green spaces in urban ecosystems, and I noticed that there are some there there are some bats, especially insect bats, uh, going around the urban mm -hmm. ecosystem. I'm sure they 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 forage or they use those urban spaces and it's really good to really understand uh, that area of uh, bat biodiversity or bat ecology yeah kasi wala lang na, na just ask kasi uh, of course diba yung bcvi diba bat uh, 
bat cave, nasa cave no. Okay. Pero parang uh, parang ina-assume na rin kasi natin yung mga urban rules can also be considered as hindi na mas well um kung baba, magbabase lang tayo kasi doon sa very very obvious na definition of uh, what is a cave. No, it it could it be a substitute for that, you know, yung urban rules na hindi na hindi easily accessible and then it could also simulate the the conditions of a cave pwede pwede kaya yun i-apply yung BCVI uh, on those uh, kinds of uh, landscapes uh, yes sir uh, yung the BCVI is actually flexible the mm -hmm. tool so you can change the criteria based sa uh, setting or magfi-fit doon sa setup maybe you um, you can change the features ng ng vulnerability yung biotic vulnerability uh, potential could uh, retain pero pwedeng i-change yung vulnerability na side so you can analyze maybe the proportion of green space or distance to bodies of water or the night light or yung like how intense or human a density. Pwede siyang gawing another factor as long as mas standardized so you have a comparable na na priority sa mga urban ecosystem. But yes, um, you can change and I encourage uh, other scientists, other bat biologists or conservation biologists to, to tweak, to change the BCVI index. You can develop like um, uh, like an urban bat mm -hmm. biodiversity index. So that's really interesting work to do, especially now na pandemic. If you don't have like access to go to the yes. caves, you can do urban studies are really good um, alternative. So yeah, it's very possible as long as you can still follow the framework or you can create your own framework. So the more in the framework, we can refine what we are doing because it's not a perfect. The BCVI is not yet perfect. We still have gaps that we are still uh, trying to address in the future. All so. right. Thank you. Uh, uh, related to that, William Joshua Tan, um, his, uh, his question is, what are the flaws of the bat cave vulnerability index uh, related to, your, to the statement that you uh, just said earlier? Okay. Uh, maybe it's not a flaw. Maybe it's the gap or, or uh, yeah, or the caveats of or the limitation, limitation of the index because um, um, there's no perfect index or there's no perfect measurement. We have first the BCVI, the first version, the first BCVI. Um, the limitation of that is it was developed for tropical caves, so we don't have like information on how to use it for temperate region because they have a different cave ecology, cave threat or cave condition. So yun yung number one, uh, the limitation of first BCVI that we addressed on the second BCVI. But the trade-off on the second BCVI is that sa unang BCVI, we include population density. Hmm population measures. On the second BCVI, um, you can read that on my on the preprint of the paper, the, uh, the, the trade-off or the limitation is we remove the population data because we cannot standardize. So st um, we don't have a standardized way of cave assessments. So we remove that, then we include the corrected weighted endemism so it's map based on like um the like the level of endemism inside the cave so those are the limitations or the gaps of the bcvi the trade-offs between the two indices right so yeah. okay thank you um i'm gonna skip the other two questions by uh william i'll proceed to the question uh given by cherry mangawang and uh, she asked, uh, Chrysler, she is asking what inspired you to focus your research path on bats? 
Okay, so hi, Mam Che. She, uh, she's my colleague from University of Southern Mindanao. So uh, what inspired me? So there's a lot of um, things. So before um, I started my research in 2010, uh, I was a research assistant before and I really uh, thank all my mentors sa kung saan ako I'm doing is because of, of them. Then first, um, it's interesting because it's like, um, it feels unique. I mean, they are like, they appear at the night. But later on, when I have a better understanding of, of them, I realized that bats are like least prioritized taxa. It's not well studied or they are often demonized. They are, they have a bad appearance in the society. And the, the, the attention like funding and efforts towards them is a uh, very, very low. So it's interesting to study those that are a uh, species that really needs attention. So you, that those are some of my uh, inspiration at present. And also right. those gaps that we need to address. So yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ma'am Cherry. A uh, question from uh, King Roy Tyrone Ombrosa, and he is, uh, he is uh, focusing for his study uh, on the uh, bat diversity of uh, Agusan del Sur. And in connection with that, uh, the, he says that the majority of the bat hunters uh, in Agusan del Sur are indigenous people and uh, in the indigenous uh, people's law, as far as he remembers, uh, they can legally do that. And so what is your stand on that? Um, yes, I agree that uh, it's legal, or I mean, should I say like uh, permitted or permitted? They are allowed to hunt, but as long as uh, it is for consumption. How I understood the the law or the the Wildlife Act is that they're allowed to hunt for subsistence or traditional use only. They're not allowed for for trade. That is a very complex issue that uh, as a conservation biologist, we cannot tell them to stop. We need to understand the, the reason why they hunt because our conservation is not about telling the world like, hey, stop doing this, stop doing that. Uh, we are all about creating balance or like a holistic uh, method or, 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 or like a recommendation. So it's a complex issue how we can tell them to minimize. So I think one of the thing we can do for that is to offer a sustainable or sensible alternatives to hunting. Because that is sometimes the default in conservation that we keep telling indigenous people to stop hunting, but we cannot really tell them to stop because we need to have because if we stop them, anong kakainin nila? So that is one of the things that we are looking right now. And yeah, in Agusan Marsh, I know that um, research groups in Agusan Marsh are really doing a good research on that. And, and it's interesting to see how their results. And we're also looking on a larger scale, like if economic is really a factor or, or if it is the biology of the bats or economic reason. So uh, that is something we're looking forward in the future. All right. So, Thank you. Yeah. So uh, a question from Jerry May uh, Flores. And the question is, how economically important are bats in agriculture uh, compared to other species in other taxa? And uh, are there any available studies in the Philippines on this topic? Probably you've come up come across uh, some of these uh, studies okay so that's really interesting like how the how crucial they are it depends on the taxa in terms of insect bats uh, in terms of i mean for insect bats yes they're very important for um, agricultural pest consumption so there are studies i think in uplb and there's also study from university of southern mindanao where they're looking on the uh, insect pest consumption of a common species. 
but we don't really have an information of the economic, I mean, the value. But in terms of fruit bats, we have a very solid evidence or a solid synthesis recently published on like how important they are for different um, plant species, especially for those that are economically and ecologically important. I can share the, the synthesis or the review paper that we developed recently, it's published. So there we found that at least um, I think thousands of, of, bat, of plant species from the tropical uh, Southeast Asia or the entire old world tropics are dependent on fruit bats. So it has a really good data and a good uh, interaction. So where you can see the values, but the economic values, there are very few. One good example we don't have in the Philippines, but we have one good example from Malaysia and Indonesia, how the nectar bats, the Unicteris spelea and other um, Flying taxes are important for pollination of durian. So they have like a value. I think they're, they also do that in, in the Philippines. But yeah, again, we don't have information on that. So isa yan sa mga another priorities for, for bat biologists to explore. So and daming pwedeng gawin. And yan yung isang example, yung like the ecosystem services. All right. Bats. Thank you. A uh, question from CE, CE Nuevo. And... Um, uh, to use a fairly popular cave in the Philippines as an illustration, have you rated the Monfort Cave using your BCVI? How is it rated and why is it that rated? Uh, why is it rated that way? Okay, so hi, hi at CE. Um, um, actually, this interesting question, I attempted to rate the Monfort Cave and it's a special cave. It's a special case in a cave. So I rated uh, uh, using the BCVI, it's 1, 1B because it's very diverse using the BCVI 1, not the, not the version 2. The first BCVI, we found that it's 1D. 1 because it's highly intact. It, it's single species, but the population is very massive. It has like at least uh, 2 million individuals at present. But the threats are not really high because it's protected. It's a private, uh, it's a private cave. So there's no hunting. Hunting is prohibited. That's why the, the population increased. Um, there's no land use activities and they are like, very safe. But we did not include Montfort Cave on both analysis because it's a, um, a special case of cave. It's a very important cave. So, all right. All right. Thank you. So hopefully, CE, uh, uh, that uh, answers your question. Uh, we have actually a comment and a comment question from Leslie Obiso. And um, he says that his masteral thesis is about the diversity of insect bats in tree habitats of Mount Lantoy, uh, Argao which is uh, within the Cebu Key Biodiversity Area. And uh, I think his, qu his question, probably you could just give an opinion, would the mist netting be enough for his uh, data gathering? Um, I think I don't, I'm not really familiar of the sampling mm -hmm. method, but yes, um, mist netting is one of the methods used for, for studying cave bats. The, the, they could be mist netting, you can integrate with harp traps. Uh, it depends. As long as you standardized your method, you did it properly, yeah, properly, I take note. But um, the capture rate may be different if you're using um, mist net versus harp traps or like the uh, bucket traps, like papaso ka sa loob ng cave, then you will, you will opportunistically uh, capture them. So it's enough as long as no standardized ang method and you mention it properly. So it should be okay. So many studies, even my first cave study, we're only using mist nets because harp traps is quite expensive and we don't have access to that before. Yes, okay. So thank you very much. I think uh, due to uh, 
uh, lack of time, uh, we will be ending our open forum yes, right sir. now. But uh, you are free to email Chrysler. Yes, no po, sir. Chrysler at gmail.com and uh, probably uh, drop a direct message uh, on his um, Twitter account, which is uh, T. Chrysler also, twitter.com. T. Chrysler. Right. So uh, just uh, save his uh, email. And if you have uh, further questions, please um, contact uh, Chrysler. So before we proceed to the um, awarding of the certificate, let me just uh, all right, share my screen. And um, the Museum of Natural History, Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension here at UPLB, College Laguna, awards this certificate of recognition to Chrysler C. Tanalgo for serving as our resource person during today's 2021 MNH Biodiversity Seminar entitled Batako, Significance of Bat Conservation and Priorities in the Philippines and the World. Held today, uh, June 7, 2021 from 2 o'clock to 3.30 p.m. Philippine Standard via uh, Philippine Standard Time via Zoom. And in witness whereof, the, the signature of our director, Dr. Marian P. De Leon, is hereby affixed. Thank you, Chrysler. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So please uh, check our website at mnh.uplb that edu.ph you could write us at mnh.uplb at up.edu.ph please favor uh go to facebook and um twitter in youtube and instagram look for the handle uplb museum please like follow and of course on our youtube account youtube channel please subscribe so that you will be notified of future uploads uh check also check our article uplb museum of natural history in Wikipedia and Trip Advisor. And with that, maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. We hope to see you on Wednesday, Philippine time. Uh, we have uh, another webinar by one of our curators, a curator for ants, Dr. Uh, Dave General. And um, we hope to see you there. <music>